Uh, so the Center for Africana Studies is an intellectual hub that brings together students, faculty, staff, and community members to discuss, collaborate, research, and engage with the historical and contemporary experiences of Africans and African descended people around peoples around the world. And so um, our center, as we said, is newly launched, but we've had some exciting events already, and um, hence you are here. So, um, and I wanted to kind of say some, well, some other exciting events that we will be also sponsoring and um, or so organizing that I want to draw your attention to. So, for example, tonight we have um, the 2024 Black Agenda, uh, Agenda event here on campus from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. in COB1, room 120. So this event brings together community leaders in and around the Central Valley to discuss matters relating to the Black community matters and issues relating to the Black community. So if you happen to find students or um, anyone here, if you happen to find yourself um, on campus tonight, feel free to pop on um, over there. Um, in January, we have Dr. Kevin Dawson, another HCREST faculty member and also a member of our steering committee for the center. Um, we'll be hosting a talk and an um, exhibition at the American Historical Association meeting. Um, and his exhibition is going to be, or panel is going to be entitled Open Water Afro Aquatics and History. And so that's going to be at the AHA, the American Historical Association meeting that's going to be taking place in January 4th through the 7th in San Francisco. And specifically, Dr. Dawson's um, panel will be held on January 6th from 1 to 3.30 p.m. So should you find yourselves historians, um, colleagues of mine um, in this room and students too um, uh, in San Francisco and attending the event, please uh, you know, make sure that you stop by. Um, we also, I wanted to throw it over quickly, just another plug for our center. Uh, our student intern, uh, Gina, will tell you quickly how to follow us on our social media um, platforms and stuff. So, Gina? Um, so, I do work as an intern for the Center for Africa Study. And right now, we're on TikTok and Instagram at um, CASUCM. Um, we're going to establish ourselves on Facebook too soon, um, but for now, you guys can follow us on there. Um, the handles are the exact same for um, CASUCM, um, so feel free to follow us because we post about opportunities like this, as well as um, we're promoting Dr. Smith's class right now that you can take um, if you're interested. And just on there, I'll be able to post more announcements, and then also you guys have to yourselves on there pretty soon, so um, feel free to follow us on there. Yes, thank you, Tina. So let with let me um, introduce our uh, speaker and our event today. So um, Dr. Nicosia Shakes teaches in the Department of History and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies here at UC Merced. She holds a PhD in Africana Studies from Brown University and degrees in political science and government from the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, Dr. Shakes specializes in um, African diasporic theater, popular culture, gender, sexuality, and activism. Her book, which we'll hear more about today, Women's Activist Theater in Jamaica and South Africa, Gender, Race, and Performance Space, published in 2023, um, won the 2017 National Women's Studies Association, University of Illinois uh, Price, Press's first book prize. In it, Dr. Shakes explores the ways in which theater contributes to Africana feminisms, womanisms, Black Radicalisms and Decolonial Thought. Along with her book, some of the other publications, her other publications appear in the Journals of the Cultural Studies, Science, Journal of Women in Culture and Society, The Black Scholar, the CLR um, James Journal, and the Jamaica Journal. She has also published chapters in several edited anthologies, including most recently, The Pelgrave Handbook on Theater and Migration, edited by Yana Marzen and Steve Wilmer. Alongside her scholarship, she has acted in, directed, written, and coordinated numerous theater productions, including her full-length play, Afiba and Her Daughters. Besides being an amazing scholar and colleague, um, Dr. Shakes is also mom to an active one-year-old uh, son named uh, Ayutunde, who is fast becoming a music and movie lover like herself. So mm -hmm. please join me in welcoming Dr. Shakes. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Satern, for that introduction. Thank you also, Dr. Sabrina Smith. Um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Satern especially invited me to give this talk, and it's always 
really heartening when your colleagues recognize your work. I also see some of my colleagues here, um, as well as students. So I really, really appreciate that. And I appreciate the work done by Elizabeth Matmoon Fatango, Krista Prenner Scotter, and Samantha Ford, and the staff of the UC Merced Library for organizing this talk. It's the end of the semester, <laughs> and I know it can be difficult to juggle exams and final papers and just the experience of mere exhaustion. So the fact that you turned out means a lot to me. This book has been in the works for a while. <laughs> it has been in the works for um, around 10 years, but I, as I will expound on later on, I think I have been writing this book in my head for 20 years, and I'll tell you why. We're experiencing a historical moment mm -hmm. of what seems like heightened conflict, and a lot of that is because we now have access to more information than in previous decades. Suffering and oppression in several parts of the world, in most parts of the world, and where the most disempowered people are also the most likely to be targeted for violence, whether we're talking about the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Palestine, Somalia, Sudan, Haiti, Venezuela, and many other places, there is a sense that a lot of the historical systems that we thought we had gotten rid of only took on new form. And it can be disheartening. Some people might withdraw into a sense of apathy, you might try to avoid the news, even though that's very difficult with social media. Just focus on daily survival and find joy wherever you can. Other people might retreat into silence, lest they be punished for their activism. And some of the activists that I'm going to discuss have actually faced that penalization for their activism. And then other people will feel motivated to do something towards social change. The folks in the book are guided by a profound optimism because essentially it is optimism that drives activism. It is a sense that you actually can change. You actually can make the world a better place. And one fact that I have learned and that all of us have learned from Africana feminisms, Black feminism, Chicana feminism, other Latin American feminisms, Asian feminisms, indigenous feminisms, what I call global majority feminisms, is that we cannot think of oppression as separate. We can think of different types of oppression as separate from others. There is a poet and playwright um, by the name of Stacey Ann Shim, Jamaican-American poet and playwright, who has a poem called All Oppression is Connected. It is a very angry, very entertaining poem, which you can actually watch on YouTube. And in it, she lists a number of different ethnicities, genders, and sexualities. And she starts by saying, at first they came for the Black people, at first they came for the Mexicans, and I did nothing because I wasn't Mexican. I did nothing because I wasn't gay. I did nothing because I wasn't a woman. And then they came for me. And what we have learned, the great contribution that these global majority feminism and womanism has made is about intersectional forms of oppression, that oppression is always intersectional, and that we always have to go to the roots of the problem. And this is why I've been saying more and more nowadays, we cannot just be anti-racist. We cannot just be anti-sexist. We cannot just be anti-fill in the blank. We also have to be anti-colonial. We have to be decolonial. 
And one of the theories that comes out of the work of these artists and activists is that they know that the root of the major systems of oppression that structure today's world began with European colonization. So that is the reason why when I speak about their work, I include race, I include ethnicity, nationality, class, and I always am careful to say decolonial, anti-colonial. So what does theater have to do with social change? It's very, very easy to dismiss theater, particularly nowadays, particularly now when most of the public activism happen on social media. It's also easy to dismiss it when you compare it to other creative forms that are more broadly disseminated, film, music, et cetera, et cetera. But theater has a unique quality that other art forms don't have. In their essay, Performativities as Activism, Sarah Matchett and Nicola Clote compare and contrast online social media-based activism to theater-based activism. And they state, quote, live performance can also inspire a sense of deep reflection. What we would call embodied reflection where the bodies of those experiencing the performance, both performers and audience, feel the need to do something that hopefully will transform the situation. Similarly, using Eve Sedgwick's formulation, Kimberly Segal states in her book, Performing Democracy in Iraq and South Africa, emotional residues and audience moods are not extra arbitrary, unimportant, or distractions from the rational forms of legislation. No, emotional responses, especially when they are repeated in diverse forms and inscribed on numerous bodies, become a political force. A lot of us have been taught to separate emotion from politics, and this is not political because it's too emotional which is often something that is targeted at, a critique targeted at women, um, people of color, et cetera. But what they're basically saying is there are poly there's a politic in the performance. So when you feel, and the feelings can be joy, sadness, joy and sadness, anger, et cetera, those feelings can become a political force. So the book is propelled by my acknowledgement of the unique qualities of theater to embody stories, including painful stories, to have a live interaction with the audience and to create connections with other forms of activism, artistic and otherwise. And I use the term activist theater to denote theater techniques and performances that seek to shed light on a particular problem or problems and inspire their audiences to care about the problem enough to contribute to addressing it. So very importantly, theater artists who work in activism have relationships with other activists. So the activism doesn't, in the same way I say all oppression is connected, activism is connected. So there's no such thing as someone who whose only activism is in theater, or whose only activism is as part of an advocacy group, et cetera. There is a connectedness there as well. And I show how there is a network of activists um, that, that the people I study connect with. Many aspects of activism, and people have done this work, can be analyzed as performative or performatic, and here I'm referencing Diana Taylor's work marches, demonstrations, rituals, and other forms of expression utilized by activists share with theater the uses of creative expression, bodies, and human-made instruments to portray a narrative. So think in terms of 
the marches and demonstrations that you see, some of them are enacting actual oppression. These can be analyzed as performative or performative. Um, in this book, though, I focus on theater. And essentially, my definition is that theater is a genre of performed storytelling, usually done in front of a live audience, utilizing different objects, props, sets, etc., as well as human bodies. So I make the distinction here. And I show how these overlap with counterparts, um, how um, these different performance forms are varied. So um, later on, I'm going to talk a little about how the activists in the book use ritual and dance and poetry, et cetera, et cetera. When we think theater, we have to think very broadly in terms of um, the performing arts. The intention of the book is to highlight how Africana women have innovated artistic and pedagogic practices within the genre of theater. So the subjects of the book are self-defined theater practitioners, many of them with years of experience. Not all of them work professionally in theater. Some of them are self-trained artists and you do get something different. There are some distinct art forms that you get um, from theater artists who are not formally trained versus theater artists who are formally trained and sometimes they work together, which produces many beautiful things. So um, I also am very open in how I think about what we call a theater artist, who we call a theater artist. So I had some preoccupations that I wanted to address in this book. The first, which is quite obvious, is the immense violence perpetrated against Black people and other members of the global majority. Second, how theater can respond to this through a gendered lens. And thirdly, I wanted to emphasize the methods that Black and African women have innovated in theater. I was particularly concerned with how white-centered the field of theater studies is. Now, um, my PhD is in Africana studies, and I've actually, many people often think that my PhD was in theater or um, English or literature, but it's actually in Africana studies. And before that, I studied um, government, government and politics. Um, but I've also spent quite a lot of time in theater and I've taken theater courses and I've studied with some very well-renowned um, theater scholars. And something that many of us agree on is how white-centered the canon of theater studies is, as in, you must read these people. Um, even when some of those people were actually quite humble and they don't want to be um, emphasized so much, you must read these people. And then what ends up happening is they now become the definition for different forms of theater, even when another artist was the one who innovated that technique. And a good example of that is um, minimalist theater. And there's a tendency to continue to call minimalist theater Brechtian. In the same way, Boal is often credited for anything that teaches a lesson. And so I kind of became frustrated with the way that I would present on a performance and a performance innovated by somebody and techniques innovated by somebody who is largely unknown. And the analysis, um, the reaction would say, oh, Brett or Boal, who I love. So this is not a snipe at them. It's a snipe at the field of theater studies. Um, and with my experience in theater, I know that people innovate techniques every day. So I wanted to focus on those people who are innovating 
um, in particular Black women, even though not every single artist in the book is Black. Um, most of the techniques, though, are innovated by Black women. So it is my contribution, along with a number of other scholars, towards um, focusing on people of the global majority, women, poor people, et cetera, and their innovations. So I said before that I think I've been writing this book in my mind for two decades, um, ever since I became involved in theater professionally. And I'm going to go off track a little and talk about my experiences. So picture me as a five-year-old. I actually look the same. My, my, <laughs> my face is actually the same. Um, picture me as a five-year-old experiencing the first play I can remember. And this play was written, produced, directed, and starring my mother, Elaine Shapes. The play was done in the canteen of the vocational training school in Seaford Town, which is a, a rural community in Jamaica that I grew up in. Um, Americans would say trade school. So it was done in the canteen, the audience were students, instructors from the school and members of the community. And it was a series of vignettes. At the time, I wouldn't know the theatrical terms, but it was a series of vignettes and it was starring my mother. My father was the principal of the school, Edward Sheik. So yes, both of my parents were educators. I had no chance. <laughs> um, so I'm watching this play, very excited. It is crowded and hot. And most of the people are taller than me. And my feet can't touch the ground. So I just remember, I was in a chair and my feet couldn't touch the ground. And what stuck with me was the essence of the story. So it was about a teenage girl who was impregnated by an older man. Um, she was kicked out of school and her family rejected her. The emotional residue I was left with at the age of five was how differently she was treated from the man who got her pregnant. And I thought that is very unfair. And you would see that that was my first gender moment. So it's my first theater moment and my first probably feminist moment or womanist moment. My mother was part of an initiative by the Jamaica Family Planning Board to teach safe sex practices to um, Jamaican communities. And so she was trained in how to use different methods to teach about um, safe sex, contraceptives, et cetera. And it was the 1980s. Those of you who have studied global community theater might know that the 1980s was a very, very productive period for community theater. Seaford Town was a very rural community. So there were no nightclubs. There were no cinemas. There were no restaurants that you could sit down in. Um, there were no parks even though we had open space, there were a lot of open space to play. So we didn't have a lot of the amenities that people in the towns and the cities had. And theater was one of the main sources of entertainment. So that is one of the gifts that community theater has given to communities like that. It's main source of entertainment. For some people, the main source of um, sharing knowledge. So that was a seed that was planted. I went on to get very involved in theater in high school, theater in university, theater after university. My first job after I did my master's at the University of the West Indies was as a researcher at an institution called Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey. It was dedicated to Marcus Garvey who is a very, very important um, Black activist who formed the largest Black organization in history, the Universal Negro Improvements Association. So I was a researcher. I was very young. I can't believe how young I was. 
but I was in charge for all of the research for the Marcus Garden Museum. Um, and having public forums with people of the, from the wider communities, etc. So I developed a Pan-Africanist, Black-focused consciousness that I guess was there since I was a little girl as well. My father told me God was Black. God is Black when I was very, very little, which stuck with me. So um, this work that I was doing, I was also doing theater work. I was doing theater work part-time. Um, so by the time I started to go to grad school in the US, I had this notion of the link between Pan-Africanism and performance and theater and women, et cetera. So it made sense that I would now do my PhD research on that. So how did I decide to study these four organizations. It started with Cistern Theater Collective. Cistern is a Jamaican theater collective that was formed in 1977. This was also a very high point for women's theater collectives all over the world. Very, very important in the Caribbean feminist movement, very, very important in discussions about um, class-based activism in Jamaica. And when I decided that my research was going to be on theater activism, I remembered everything that Sistrin had done. Sistrin is a fixture in Jamaican theater. It's very hard to work with any theater person in Jamaica who has not worked with Sistrin. But because I was doing Africana studies, I wanted my study to be transnational. And it was just by chance that I found out about the Mother Tongue Project in South Africa, which is also a women's theater collective. So the first part of the research was a comparative study of Sistrin and the Mother Tongue. Sistrin is much younger. It was formed in the period after apartheid in South Africa. Um, they just celebrated their 21st um, anniversary. And what struck me was the similarities, the collective method, their commitment to collectivity, and um, what some people call participatory democracy in the way that they organized their activism and the way that they came up with their performances. So when I was in Jamaica and South Africa doing the ethnography, I then started to work with the Letters from the Dead project. The Letters from the Dead project comes out of research that the, um, the principal researcher, Honor Ford Smith, had done in Jamaican communities and the Jamaican diaspora. And it takes his name from one of the, activi um, the activities in the Letters from the Dead project where people in communities would compose letters to their dead loved ones and letters from their dead loved ones. So Honor Ford Smith is also the artistic director of Sistrin. And that's how I met her. And then I became involved in the Letters from the Dead project. When I was in South Africa to do the research on the Mother Tongue project, I just found out about a theater formed by a black woman called Olive Tree Theater, which is in um, one of the most well-known townships in South Africa, Alexandra. And I contacted them, went to their Women's Theater Festival, and that is how everything developed. So the main commonality among these four organizations is that they're women-led. The second commonality is that even though not everyone involved in them is Black, that they are driven by a Black and African aesthetic mainly. The Mother Tongue Project also does a lot of work on South Asian, um, South Asian descended women and has South Asian aesthetics in their work. I also realized that there was a lot that they do in their theater that theorizes about issues in a way that only theater can. 
So my approach is to see theater as a theory. And this fits in with the approach that you see in the work of not just these theater artists, but a number of recent theater scholars. So the theory is in the performance. The theory is in the performance. And by studying their performances, we start to learn a lot about their societies and about how marginalized people think about their societies. Each chapter of the book is organized according to a particular performance event. Um, and so I am always very, very careful to emphasize that these performance events, some of these performance events predate the huge I call it an uprising, but the, the, the flooring that you see in women-led activism is mostly on social media. So some of these events, um, very public, most of them, happening before we saw that grand um, flooring of social media-based activism. And in the book, I talk about why we can't separate them. So, I'm going to talk a little about the performances and how the chapters are organized. Um, this is a very early photograph of Sister and Theatre Collective, um, founded mostly by working class Black women, even though middle class women were also collaborators. And these are the performers for the skit that I analyzed in the book. So these performers are from a community in Jamaica called Hannatown. They are the Hannatown Cultural Group. And they devised a 12-minute skit around abortion that was performed in the Jamaican House of Parliament, not outside of it, not as part of another presentation. The actual skit was their presentation to Parliament. In Jamaica, abortion is illegal in the constitution. Um, there's a common law exception in cases where the mother's life or health is threatened. Um, so for decades, there has been activism around amending the constitution to legalize abortion. There's disagreements about in what cases should it be legalized, et cetera. So a slice of reality was from it came about because Sistrin and the Hanaton Cultural Group were going around Jamaica collecting stories, including from women who had had abortions. And then they put a skit together. When the time came for different civil groups to make their presentation in the House of Parliament, which in America would be equivalent to Congress. So think Black women drumming and singing in Congress in the United States and talking about sex and abortion. So that would be the equivalent in the US. Um, so when the time came, they decided they were not gonna read a paper, they were going to perform a skit. So I analyzed how that skit contributed something that was lacking to the debates. The skit was done in the voices and bodies of working class black women. And we know across the world, how working class black women are made invisible, but also very visible whenever there's a conversation that is negative. So in their own voice, they stated what their position was, and it was critically needed at that time. So this is the Hanaton Cultural Group, and this is the House of Parliament, where, and I found myself there in 2019 as well, we can talk about that. This is the House of Parliament where the performance was done. So the second performance is a performance called Walk South Africa. And this was by the Mother Tongue Project done in 2014, and it has had seven different, many different performances after that. Walk South Africa was done in response to the horrific sexual assault and murder of a 17-year-old um, Black girl called Anine Boyson in South Africa. 
And it was signifying on walk, which is an Indian performance done by an artist called Maya Krishna Rao that she did in response to the other earlier horrific sexual assault and murder of an Indian, 22-year-old Indian woman named Jyoti Singh Pandey. Um, this was in 2012, December 2012. I don't know how many of you know that that um, case caused massive protests in India and neighboring countries. So Anian Boyson was murdered in February 2013. And so um, the mother tongue decided to have a conversation with the um, the similar assaults in India. So they have Walk South Africa, emphasis on Walk. And in Walk, the different performers highlight a different aspect of sexual violence in South Africa, including its historical prominence under the system of apartheid. Um, and so I look at the different theories that each performer produces in the performance around um, the common experiences of women, but also the different experiences of women and the particular vulnerabilities of Black women, how the historical um, experiences of sexual violence in South Africa affect South Africa today, and so on. And at the end of walk, the performers literally walk out. So the, um, the first set of performances had the performers actually walk out of the performance space and the audience follows them. So it's a literal walk. And I talk about how that literal walk, um, Sarah Matchett, who is the artistic director, said they wanted to like literally move the audience's feet, not just their emotions, but their feet. Um, and how that walk transforms women's bodies into an active force. So the performances are very visceral. This is one of the images from the performance. And this is a new play that the mother tongue has produced. So Letters from the Dead began in around 2016, 2017. It actually began after a young white woman was murdered in Toronto. And communities of color, indigenous people, et cetera, in Toronto felt like the media was focusing far more on this murder than with other murders of people of color, black people, et cetera, in Canada. And so um, it started with a public street performance through the streets of Toronto. And the second performance, which is the one to your, well, over here, was done in Jamaica, um, in the streets of downtown Kingston. And I have some images here. Now, Letters from the Dead is a huge transnational project that I can't fully encapsulate in this talk. But essentially, it is about how communities memorialize and heal communities affected by intense violence. How do they memorialize and heal? And how do public memorials murals and so on contribute to this healing, but also make the case that these communities themselves are addressing the problem of violence. So um, something that is very common in Jamaica, which has a very high murder rate, is the notion that um, inner city urban communities don't have a problem with the violence. They are just violent people. You recognize that they're just violent people. So poor Black people are just violent. So what public memorials show is that they're actively trying to, to change the situation. So I analyze a play called A Vigil for Roxy, which was done in 2015 as part of an exhibition called Song for the Beloved, Memory and Renewal at the Margins of Justice. And this is, um, part of the exhibition is a long memorial table that's influenced by um, Black and Indigenous mourning practices. And the audience are invited to write cards and place them on the table. 
And this is a card that was written by a child that is really, really heartening. Um, so the a Vigil for Roxy was done at a staged reading. A staged reading is where the performers literally read from the script and they might have some costume in, set, etc. And at the end, there's a discussion with the audience. So it's highly interactive. And so I analyze how the different characters in the play allow you to understand the, the fullness of the problem of violence in Jamaica, including violence by the state and how state violence actually has produced the very gang violence that the elites complain about. So this was the last organization that I decided to study. Um, the Olive Tree Women's Theater Festival of 2015 in Alexandra. So my emphasis is on how Insin Mokogo uses theater to uplift her community, uses theater to create a different narrative of Alexandra than the mainstream narrative that you get. So something that has stuck with me is I knew about the violence in Alexandra before I knew about anything else. And I had to do the research. Actually, I had to speak to the people at the theater to understand how important Alexandra is to the activism against apartheid in, in um, South Africa. And how important Alexandra is in terms of black property ownership during the system of apartheid. So she decided in Singmokoro to found her theater in Alexandra and not another part of South Africa and to have a women's theater festival to address the dearth of young black women as directors in South Africa. So I do an analysis of the significance of Alexandra as part of South Africa and the African diaspora, as well as the Women's Theater Festival and its contribution to developing the work of young Black women. Um, some people might say it's a longitudinal study because I interviewed some of these women that you see over here in 2015 and then in 2022. And it was really great to see how they had grown. And many of them were professionally in the media and theater industries and talk about the importance of the Women's Theater Festival. Well, this is the image from, by the way, everybody, if you're writing a book, take your own photographs. <laughs> take your own photographs. So I took this photograph and then I didn't have to get copyright clearance, et cetera. Um, Olive Tree had to close because of the pandemic and the fact that it was already underfunded, which made me very sad. Um, but Insing Mokoro said to me in our conversation this year, she's no longer sad about it because she did the work that she needed to do, which I think is a very good way of looking at it. So those are the groups. Now, why is the subtitle of the book gender, race, and performance space. What does space have to do with any of this? The approach that I take is to look not just at the performances, but also the significance of space, the performance space, as well as the larger national space. So many of the performances could be defined as site specific. They're not done in a theater. They're done in different public spaces. So they take the performance to the audience. But I also look at the significance of a public performance, particularly to women and black women. I look at the public space as a site of penalization, harassment, racial and um, gender harassment, punishment, which began under colonialism and slavery, public humiliation and public punishment. And so a public performance, particularly one that talks about 
intimate issues, sexual issues, gender issues. It has that capacity to contest the way that the public space has been defined as a space where only certain bodies are free. So, um, and in that case, I, I look at Black feminist geography as well as Black feminist, sorry, Black womanist geography and the work that has been done there, Catherine McKittrick's work, Sylvia Winter's work, to make that connection between place and race and gender. Um, my approach, I don't call it participant observation, I call it co-performative witnessing, because I'm emphasizing that I like these people, I'm a performer, I come from theater, but also co-performative witnessing emphasizes that collaborative relationship that can form between a researcher and the subjects of the research. And this comes out of Dwight Conkergood's work, read Dwight Conkergood, and Sayini Madison's work on um, using ethnography to study theater. So I'm going to close with at the beginning, I talked about the relationship between theater and other art forms and other types of activism. And the book is about theater. But I also looked to other performances that were inspirational. So I'm going to close with an excerpt from my coda. And it's called Neela's Dance, A Reflection. She's dressed in black tights, black lipstick, and a purple veil. And without any prompting, she enters the circle and begins dancing, moving with such precision and beauty that those not familiar with her techniques would think her dance was completely intuitive. The accompanying drums and tambourines are loud and manage to drown out the sound of the vehicles in the streets on this busy, hot Saturday afternoon. She's in a tight circle of people, some of whom are playing instruments and moving their hips and legs lightly as they watch her. At one point, her feet shuffle in the style of Dinky Mini, a well-known African-inspired Jamaican dance. At another point, she cuts and clears with the action of someone wielding a machete a revivalist tendency. She uses the stiff shoulder and hip movements that one would see Kumina adherents do at a ceremony. And then for a few seconds, she performs the shifting foot movements similar to those done in Tambo, another African-inspired Jamaican dance. Her body functions as an archive of Jamaican and African diasporic expression. The dancer's name is Neela Ibanks, and she is a well-known choreographer, lecturer at the Jamaica School of Dance, at the Enamana College of the Visual and Performing Arts, and founding director of E and Company, a dance collective. The venue of her performance is Halfway Tree Square, Kingston, one of the busiest thoroughfares in the country, an event is the Survivor Empowerment March organized on March 11, 2017 by the Tambourine Army, an activist organization formed by Taitu Heron, Latoya Nugent, and Nadine Spence. They represent survivors of sexual violence in collaboration with numerous other advocacy groups. According to Ebanks, they had decided in conversation with Taitu Heron, who is in white, who led the spiritual aspect of the march that upon reaching halfway tree, she would perform the dance encircled by members of the end company. When viewed as a whole, the dance and the circle constitutes a ritual of memorializing, healing, confronting the phenomenon of sexual violence and generating positive energy against it. 
I was writing up my research in the United States. It was March, it was cold, it was Providence, Rhode Island. And I was feeling depleted and stressed out when this March and others were happening. However, seeing Neela's dance via a mobile phone video posted to YouTube by Sherry Cox energized and empowered me. Her dance communicated with me across borders. It was a dance that I recognized because its movements were so fundamental to Africana cultures and in particular to Jamaican women's audacity through movement. Throughout this book, I've argued in support of theater that consciously attends to the importance of geographic spaces in producing ideas about race, gender, sexuality, and class, liberatory ideas. African and women-led theater projects, such as the ones that I examine in the book, teach us lessons about the role of creative expression in grappling with the afterlives of colonialism, apartheid, racialized slavery, newer structures of racism, and globally and nationally specific iterations of patriarchy. Sistering, Mother Tongue, Olive Tree, and Letters from the Dead belong to long traditions of Africana women storytelling and political activism that are found in various means of centering gender and race in conversations about democracy and freedom. And that is tied to Heron at the end. She is an Ifa priestess. So essentially that is what my book is about. It is about how we see theater. It's about how we see black women. It is about how we see activism. It is about how we see space and the relationship among all of those. Thank you. I just let it stay so you can enjoy the dance. Thank you, everyone. So we'll um, open it up for some questions for the next uh, 20 or 15 minutes or so. So I'll let Dr. Shakes appeal to any questions that she might have from the um, uh, talk. Yes. Thank you so much, Not Dr. Baker. Jakes, for your wonderful presentation and uh, for sharing your work. I really love the photographs and the videos, so thank you for sharing those as well. Um, so I'll go back to something you said at the very beginning. You mentioned that the people, or the women in the book, are guided by profound optimism. And so since you talked about your own story and your own kind of history with um, theater, can you say a little bit about how that profound optimism has made its way into your own work? Um, so it sounds like a paradox because activists are always complaining about a problem. Um, but essentially, you have to be an optimist to think you can actually change the problem. And so it, it connects with work that I've done in theater and work that I've done outside of theater, where I have tried to use the um, research, performance, teaching, et cetera, to address different problems. Um, I don't know how many of you know of Gina Ulysses' work. She's a um, very well-known Black woman um, anthropologist. She said that research is activism, um, which some people disagree with. She says research is activism and the ethnographic project is activism because essentially in studying these people, especially marginalized people, you are trying to create change in academia. And that comes from optimism. So um, I haven't defined my research work as activism, probably because I'm engaged in other activisms. But I think in a sense, you could also look at that work of research alongside other work I've done as coming from, it, it's almost a radical kind of optimism um, that change is possible and we just need to work towards it. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? 
Yes. Um, so racialized oppression, reproductive violence, it's definitely not anything new to the US. It's kind of our whole thing, actually. Um, and are there groups in the US doing anything close to this? And do um, the work the works in Jamaica and South Africa inform that at all? Um, you mean theater based work? Yeah. So I I can't speak to any contemporary um, theater groups. I can speak to um, other women's collectives I know who do that kind of work. There's a group called Spider Woman Theater founded by three indigenous women in New York, and it's a collective, and they, they address the same issues as this group. Um, look them up. They're still around. Um, I teach a, a course called Black Women's Theater, where I include the work of people like Ntozaki Shange and um, Danai Gurira, who is Zimbabwean American, and how they, a lot of their work is actually transnational. And so there is a, there is a play called In the Continuum by Nicole Salter and Danai Gurira, which is really good, really important, which looks at HIV AIDS among Black women in the US and Black women in Zimbabwe and make the connection. So um, there's work by individual playwrights, the Spider Woman Theater, I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting the name of some other theater collective who are doing this kind of theater-based work. Um, and some other groups might occur to me after the talk. By the way, um, if you want me to come up with a reading list to accompany this talk, I can do that. So if you want to do that and share it with the talk online, I can also do that. Um, so yeah, I, I can't think of contemporary groups, but that, that work, and I know the work of Sistrin and the work of um, the mother tongue, et cetera, draws from different um, playwrights. There is a section of the play, Vigil for Roxy, that draws from um, actually several plays, Jamaican and otherwise. It's broadly international. The street performances also draw from street performances in the US, Canada, um, Asia, Latin America, etc. So there is there's always that connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this. I love learning more about your work. I'm I'm thinking it's also makes a lot of sense to me that black women are at the forefront of doing this activism, speaking to uh, the forms of oppression they experience across race and gender. But since you did a gendered analysis, I'm curious, like what sort of perception or pushback or resistance did black men pose? And I also know that they're what they were a part of some of it. So can you speak to how like masculinity either like supports or detracts from these movements? So um there is a review that was written of a play that the mother tongue did, which isn't even an explicitly feminist play, and a male critic wrote mm -hmm. that they are a bunch of raving feminists. <laughs> so um Sister yeah. Theatre Collective, particularly in the 70s, not so much now, they were called um, all types of um, lesbian slurs, um, feminist, which is a bad word for many people, et cetera. So the groups themselves have had to um, encounter patriarchy, not just in their stories, but in terms of the reception. Um, with me, I am trying to to remember if there was ever an inc oh <laughs> so um I did see that I became involved in some of these projects. So after um I started doing work on the skit that was performed in Parliament as part of the um the debates to introduce a termination of pregnancy act, um the Sistrin and Hanaton Cultural Group skit. It inspired me to become part of the activism to change Jamaica's anti-choice laws. Mm -hmm. 
And so in 2019, I presented to Parliament. Um, I presented with um, a group of people. Um, we, we submitted something to Parliament, we submitted a paper and then we presented it. And I feel like it was a clinic in patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we all know that patriarchy isn't always, just like racism, it doesn't say, I hate women. It, it never does. Um, it was a clinic in patriarchy because of how male-centered the conversation was. Um, there was a group of um, fundamentalist Christian activists who had already presented earlier in the year and on the day when the anti-choice, the, the pro-choice groups were supposed to present, um, a priest who was part of that group basically told the chairman, we want to present again. So we come to parliament and we're as pro-choice, as the pro-choice group to present. And there is a large gathering of um, this group. They were allowed to present for one hour. Each of us, the, the different pro-choice groups are given 20 minutes. And this group was allowed to present for one hour. And it was mostly men speaking in the group. Um, mostly men in parliament because it's the legislature is mostly men. And I had never felt the, I had never felt patriarchy so much in my life. <laughs> um, you probably wouldn't see how I feel if you watch the video, which I can't even watch um, because we were very forthright, but it was an experience in patriarchy that I had never had before. Um, so that is an example of something I experienced doing this research. There will always be uh, um, questions about what about the men? Um, men are suffering too. Um, a lot of the men who I interviewed and who are part of um, these projects either say they are feminist or they are pro woman, but I think that's because they were already working with them, with the people doing this work. Um, the Letters from the Dead project is women-led, but it involves men and other people, men, children, the entire community. And in my analysis in that chapter, I talk about how the play addresses um, men's centrality in violence, um, as well as women's role in violence, but also their the suppressed roles, the suppressed positions that they have. Um, yeah, I hope I responded to the yeah. question. That was very long. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. James, again for your Thank you for coming.